Before I introduce tonight's speaker, a word about next month. July the 6th, we'll be going back to some, the genealogical aspect of our society, because tonight's more of a history. Uh, Pamela Vestal will be joining us for her program, What the Heck Does That Say? If you uh, have ever worked with um, census records or even cemetery plot, um, tombstones and try to read some of these things, well, she has done a program on reading handwriting and other written materials and try to decipher what they're, what they're saying. So that will be a Zoom pro program, and her name is Pamela Vestal. A reminder that here on the back table, we have a sign-up for anyone willing to provide snacks for one of our meetings tonight. Snacks are provided by Pat Blanchard, and as you'll find, she's worked hard in the kitchen all day today. So. The Costco credit card. <laughs> you may sign up for any month, July through September, and or, um, or, and or November. And yes, we will remind you if you feel like you need one, you can just check the box and we'll give you a call or a, send you a, te a text or an email and, and remind you of that. Our speaker tonight traveled over the grapevine to join us from his home in uh, Northridge. Mr. O'Connell grew up in Three Rivers and it was through that connection that he, he learned about tonight's subject, the Korea Colony. A little personal thing that uh, Sharon and I, my wife and I, we first learned about Kuya Colony. We were driving in the back roads of Three Rivers and we got lost and all of a sudden we came upon this, I think it was like a, a, a the post office. Well, the post office, but further deeper in, into the woods. Uh, the oh, the was, advance ruins? Pardon me? The ruins from advance? We found something about the Kauia colony. Yeah. We'd never heard of it. We didn't know what it was. So ever since then, I've been trying to find this guy. And uh, I think we had a little plaque there. And uh, we had a little article there that we stuck up there. I think Terry helped do that. So Mr. O'Connell has uh, authored multiple books, including Cooperative Dreams, A History of the Kauia Colony. Professionally, he is in TV or television production having most recently served as line producer on the CBS comedy, United States of L. I don't know if you watched the program when it was on. Sharon and I never missed an episode. Oh, really? But we loved it. We thought, oh. it was, we thought it was hilarious. Oh, it was uh, um, it was also has other television uh, series in development and another book also. So. Maybe he'll fill us yeah. in a little bit on what he's uh, doing. Another book. I went, oh my, I got kind of do. I have a, yeah. Let me say that. Yeah, I'm going to get it out. I'm going to get it out on Kendall. It's, it's a compilation. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> so would you please welcome with me Jay O'Connell. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I want to make sure that this, this thing, this computer here is, is, oh, I'll do it from my mouse. Um, so I guess my first question to you guys is, let me get my, hmm, what did I do with oh, my meeting card? Oh, here it is. Let's see if we can get the cover of the book on here. Oh, oh you know what? I got to re reboot the, co the computer. It went to sleep. Anyway, yeah, I grew up in Three Rivers, and um, I never took a history class in my life in college. And I got interested in, in history, oddly enough, Oh, in my 20s, I got fascinated with Irish history. And I went to Ireland in 85, I went, or 86, I went in 88. Um, and I remember thinking, boy, this history is so interesting. I wish there was something closer to home that was that, that was interesting. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and um, I think in the book I write that um, I'd always, growing up, I'd always heard there was a, a group of, uh, of socialists, uh, progressive thinkers, um, lived up the North Fork back in the day. And having grown up in the 60s, I just figured that they were hippies ahead of their time. 
And then I don't even remember when I started doing a little bit of research on it. And then uh, uh, I started doing a little more and found out, you know, how fascinating the story was. And tonight I'll talk about sort of how it kind of began, the roots of it. Um, because I think that's something that most people, they kind of know it was there. How many people are, are familiar at all with the colony? Yeah, I think most people have heard about it. And most people just know that it was a, I guess the phrase we hear a lot is socialist utopian endeavor. Is that kind of what everyone thinks? And it kind of was. Um, the largest living thing on the planet is not far from here. Although right now with the road closed, you can't get there from here. But uh, do you know what I'm speaking? General Sherman. Named after a certain uh, fellow by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh -huh. um, how many know the other name by which that tree used to go? Anybody? You can see that tree in the cover here. And in the, in the wider shot, which uh, I can jump to the wider shot, maybe. Let's see if I can do that here. Let's jump to that. Oh, I had this in order that I was going to use it. But I, on my feet, I decided to. You can see, I think I counted at one point 40 people to control the rest get an idea of how large that tree is. The Karl Marx tree. So, I've often used that as kind of a hook for this thing. Um, so how did the colony start? In the 1880s, 1885 to be specific, and again I'm going to be testing my memory. I wrote this book 25 years ago. I told Dan I haven't really spoken about it for 20 years. But um, there were a group of San Francisco intellectuals, progressives, uh, a lot of people were labor, uh, labor agitators. Uh, some were involved in the union, the, the Coast Seamen's Union, which will come in very handy later on, having all these working men. Uh, some were involved with the IWW, the International Working Men's thing. One fellow in particular, uh, who will later on as the driving force behind it, was also a journalist, was also a lawyer, was, uh, and he wrote a, this newspaper was published in 1884, and uh, this was edited by a fellow by the name of Burnett Haskell. And Burnett Haskell was the driving force behind the colony. Um, we, can, we can kind of attribute three men to being the leaders of the colony would be Burnett Haskell, uh, an Englishman by the name of James J. Martin, and a, another San Francisco lawyer, he was I think a patent lawyer, uh, by the name of John Redstone. There's still a place up in Three Rivers that some people still call Redstone Ranch. Uh, and then currently it's a place called the Riata Ranch. Uh, it's very good friends who run Riata. And, uh, but that was, that was Redstone property. So anyway, um, Back in the mid-80s, this group got together and in San Francisco and formed a group. It was the, oh, I even have notes here for people help me. It was called the Cooperative Land Purchase and Colonization Association. And they were, they had read a certain writer by the name of Lawrence Gronwin, G-R-O-N-L-U-N-D who was Marxist inspired and, and talked about a cooperative society. In those days, it's interesting, they used, they used two terms. They used um, cooperative and they used competitive. And you could substitute in sort of modern parlance, you could substitute for competitive, you can, you can substitute the word capitalist. And cooperative, you can substitute socialist. You know, some people think it, was, it leaned towards communism, but it was, um, it was more apt, aptly, I think, described as socialist. But they, they called it cooperative and competitive. And they wanted to set up a cooperative community experiment. You've probably heard the term socialist utopia. 
which is how a lot of people describe it. But though they wanted to set up this this community, and they needed they needed some sort of resource by which to sustain their community experiment. And at one point, there was a fellow who was a member of this um, this organization. By the way, so here is this is our man Burnett right here, Burnett Haskell, which we'll talk about a lot tonight. And then next to him is James James Martin. Down here is Burnett's wife, Annie. Her name is Anna Fader. And we'll close the evening uh, reading some of her diary entries. And her diary is one of the most remarkable things I've ever come across. And I'll tell you the story about how I first saw the original diary in the Bancroft Library. They brought the box out and they opened it up, maybe put on the white gloves. I opened these little diaries like this, little leather bound, thin pages. I opened up and I looked at it, and I had driven all the way up to, to Berkeley. I was staying with a friend up there. I was so excited. I'm looking at this. I stared at it for five minutes and couldn't read a word of it. I'm like, oh my god. Anyway, after getting it on microfilm and printing it and pouring over it, at first it would take me ten minutes to read a paragraph, and then I got to the point where I could read her handwriting. But it's remarkable. But this is. Her next wife, and this is their, their child. Uh, his name was Astaroth. Burnett was also a bit of a spiritualist and science fiction thing, and he was just all over the place. So this is the group. This was a picnic, I think, somewhere in San Francisco. I don't really recognize anybody else in this picture except this fellow right here. His name was Anthony Larson, and he was a big Swede. And we'll see pictures later on in the road building days where he was uh, he was a lot of the brawn of the, of the thing. And there's a theory that these two had a little bit of a... So let's see what else we've got here. So in 1885, I believe it was, it could have been early 86, one of the members of this uh, Cooperative Land Purchase and Colonization Association, the name of, of Keller, uh, why am I blanking on Keller's first name? I keep thinking of his son. But uh, Charles Keller. Charles Keller was riding in a train through the valley, and he overheard some land uh, agents talk about this area of the Sierras that was open to, to file timber claims on it. But nobody had really done it because everyone expected that area of the Sierras was inaccessible. So he heard, heard about this. He came back and told, told that group, and they all marched up to Visalia and decided to file timber claims. So they go to the land office in Visalia and see if we have the right picture coming up. That's Burnett. There's another picture of Burnett. And that's James Martin. This is taken a bit later in life. Um, this, is not, this is not contemporary of the colony days. This probably could have been taken in 1910, 1920. And I actually one time talked to his granddaughter and I'm going to be all over the place tonight, just bear with me. People always ask me, well, did you ever interview descendants of the colony? And I bet you got some great information. I said, you know, I, I've talked to a few, either first generation descendant or second generation, and you never really get much because it's, it's sort of family legends that. But I talked to this woman. She lived in Sea Canyon. Does anybody know where Sea Canyon is by San Luis Obispo? Yeah. Yeah, and they had, she grew up on an apple ranch in Sea Canyon because it's a little, it's a microclimate there. It's perfect for apples, I guess. And I interviewed her, I guess in the 90s, and she was in her 80s. And she remembered Grandpa Martin when he was an old, old elderly gentleman and he lived there with his, uh, you know, his son, which would be this woman's father. And the one thing she remembered about him that, that gave me a clue to his character she said, yeah, Grandpa Martin would always be out, out in the orchard, and he always had his necktie. <laughs> he was always a very proper English gentleman. So those are the three, three key figures. They go to the land office in Visalia, general land office, and they file claims. Now, this cooperative land purchase association had a number of members, uh, dozens, uh, most of them all from San Francisco, some of the you know, lawyers and journalists and that, and then the other tier was a lot of out-of-work sailors because Burnett and James Martin uh, were involved in the Coast Seamen's Union. 
So they got these guys that said, hey, we're all going to get together. We go out and we file these claims. So these timber claims were in an area not too far from Giant Forest. Some were uh, just to the west of it, uh, going down. Any of you know where the, the old Colony Mill is? Um, if you go up uh, North Fork in Three Rivers, you can go up the old road that they built. But it was not necessarily in the big trees. It was in the timber belt, timber belt just below the big trees, all uh, uh, fir and pine. And they were going to log that. And their original plan was to build a railroad up to that. So let's see what the picture is next. So maybe this one. Here's California in the 1880s. Got the Southern Pacific Railroad. It comes down here. Here's Giant Forest. Here's White Sia. There is his, his down the base there. And then this is the Korea watershed. Giant Forest is right in here. And this is where they eventually built their road to. And we'll talk about the road building. So you can see they weren't really in the big trees. Uh, they ever had any intention to log the big trees because that was not sort of commercially viable. Uh, giant sequoias are very hard to log. They're hard to cut down. And the, the, the more valuable timber was in this pine and fir belt all along through here. So then their step was to come up and start building uh, access to it. Pretty early on, I think they realized that a railroad was not uh, viable. So they decided to build a wagon road. And in those days, Three Rivers was a little village in here, it is obviously here, where the South Fork uh, meets the Middle Fork. And North Fork is not far from it. Everybody thinks Three Rivers was named for the three rivers, the North Fork, the Middle Fork, and the South Fork all meeting within a mile of each other. But I've been told the South Fork in those days kind of split and kind of forked off a little bit right before it met. And where the South Fork came into two things and the Middle Fork met, that's what they call it, Three Rivers. Because it does where the Three Rivers met. And if, I don't know how many people are familiar with the geography of Three Rivers at all, but Old Three Rivers was right there where the Old Three Rivers Road comes out and then, you know, right, right there near South Fork. So where those be. So there was a little bit of a village there. There were obviously ranchers down, down by the what today is the lake. And there were a few homesteaders up. This is the North Fork. So they, their claims were up here, but they got egress and they started building their road right about in here. And within a, a year or two, they set up a tent camp at a place called Advance. So. I guess the, the question, and feel free to answer, quite ask questions anytime. Stop me, anything that comes to your mind, because you guys can steer where this goes. Um, how did they fund this endeavor? I guess that's that's a question that would, would, would I think would come up, because they had this uh, this organ, this association, it was called a land purchase association. Now they filed timber claims, so. Uh, really was not a purchase at this point. Um, they sold memberships in this association. And you could you could become a member if you paid the, I don't know what the the rates were, you know, or to pay for your membership, you could work in and at in labor. So realize a lot of these guys were labor leaders. A lot of these guys had a lot of out of work sailors in San Francisco. Said, we'll put you up. You come here, we'll take care of all your needs. You just help us clear the road, and you can you can earn yourself a membership. And then when we when we get to our timber and we become a viable cooperative community, everybody shares, everybody's equal. The laborer makes the same amount of money as the as the, the lawyer, as the prep, you know what I mean? And so a little bit of a scheme. A little bit of a Ponzi scheme. And so they had free labor to build this road. And, you know, this day you can drive up North Fork. Oops. And this, I've got some pictures of. You can drive up North Fork. Here's a group of them. And, you know, they say they built the whole road uh, with, you know, hand tools and stuff like that. But they did a, they did a number of, uh, quite a bit of blasting. Obviously, they didn't have jackhammers. They didn't have bulldozers. They had that. 
but they had dynamite. And, well, because they were labor, they were radical labor leaders, right? So you know, who knows? Um, this is the guy I told you about. We saw him. We saw him sitting behind Annie early on. This is the big sweet F, and Andrew Larson. Um, so they built this road. They started not far above where Korea is today, and this is one of my favorite pictures because you can see right there along the North Park. And I've driven up, every time I drive up North Park, I think I know exactly where this section is because there's not a lot of places where the rocks and the river are right there. And you can see, and you can see a guy up here on the thing, and you can see there literally, you see this guy right here, he's just pounding the, the rock, breaking it up. So you build this road, there's another, I think this is a closer version of that same shot, right? Because we're going to see this guy. And they get up to advance. And probably 87, 88 into 89, uh, advance was the primary settlement of the colony. And it was a tent city. And everybody wonders, well, how many people lived in advance? 150, maybe at the most 200. And, but of those 200, you know, half of them were the road crew that were either working further on up the road. And they did some smaller camps up the road, but this became a, a primary village. And there was a school set up here. There was, one tent was a school. One tent was like a, 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 a commissary, thing like that. And I want to say 89. I have to look. They actually got a post office charter, and they started running. You know, and everybody. How many are familiar with the Korea Post Office in the Rivers? Everybody thinks that was the that the colony built that. That was actually built later on by descendants of Charles Keller, who was the member who we remember uh, overheard these timber claims were becoming available. And that that structure, I think, was built in 1911. So the early days of the Kuya Post Office was just a tent at advance. And it was literally just um, uh, a stage that would run back and forth to Visalia twice a week. Were they, uh, were they there year round? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now you're below so you're below snow level here. Oh. Advance is probably about 2,500 feet, 2,000, 2,500 feet. So there are pictures of, of a little snow on the ground, but you know, once or twice a year. <clears throat> There's a little, a little closer shot of it, you know. And I've been there a number of times and tried to ID these, these rocks across the river and I can find exactly where it is. You can still find, at that same place there are some old CCC ruins, which a lot of people think, yeah, here's a thing. And you can see this, you can see, you know, you see the woman with her parasol, you know, they were substantial tents. And there was children there. Um, starting in, I wish I knew my dates better, but let's say 89 maybe. Remember, Burnett Haskell was a newspaper editor. He was a labor leader. He was a lawyer. And they produced a, a newspaper. So, I mean, this kind of was, in a weird way, a thriving community. And um, how many are familiar with Joe Doctor? Everyone knew Joe, right? When I started doing the research, everyone said, oh, you have to talk to Joe Doctor. He's the expert, right? He's the expert. And I didn't want to until I kind of knew. So I had been doing research for a while. And you guys can look afterwards. I have all 92 issues of the Korea Commonwealth, the original Korea Commonwealth, all printed out. So one can see if one wants a little of the day-to-day Minutia of life at advance. It's here. It's a lot of like small town newspaper, you know, so and so visited their aunt, and you know, so and it, 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 but there's also a lot of hard news. Um, and we'll get to what, what happened quickly. I gotta keep an eye on the top. Oh, yeah, we're gonna have to move along. Thanks so much. Um, so I, go to, I, I finally go to see Joe. I go to his, I go to his house. I think I called Julie and said, hey, can I go, you know, can, you know, can you call your dad and set up a meeting? And uh, so go out there, and he was, he was literally towards the end of his life. And I go and I sit down with him, and we had just, uh, before that, the new Korea Commonwealth published, how many are familiar with the Three Rivers newspaper when it was the Korea Commonwealth? For a number of years, uh, they published a newspaper and they copied that masthead. And on the very first issue, I wrote a thing 
about how, oh, the new Commonwealth, you know, picks up where the old Commonwealth left off after 92 issues. So I go to see Joe Doctor, and he's, and he, and he goes, oh, I saw that, I saw that thing in the, that new paper. I go, oh, yeah, what'd you think? He goes, oh, they never did 92 issues. Who, who would say that they did 92 issues? I looked at him, and I went, I went, uh, I did? Well, where'd you get that? I said, because I have all 92. He goes, really? I said, yeah, I got it, you know. So I think after that, Joe kind of respected me. So we talked for a while, and he goes, oh, hang on a second, I'm going to go get you some. He disappears, you know, he kind of, you know, and comes back out, and he plops this box. Right? And, um, and we were talking about, we were really talking about the, the box that Lillian Kale, that Lillian's daughter gave me. This was the same thing. It's like, oh my gosh, Joe Doctor, and he gives me this box, and all his notes and drafts of all his articles, his uh, interviews with Burnett's son back from the day, with, you know, so it was kind of, I felt like the passing of the torch. I felt, you know, I got my street cred with Joe Doctor. <laughs> and tragically, I think he passed six months after that. You know, so I was, I was very fortunate that I, I got to, to meet him and, and know him just a little bit. Yeah. He was on my farm show committee for many years. Oh, really? And, yeah. And he wrote the newsletter for the um, volunteers. And it was great to yeah. have him do that. Yeah, and another another person I got a lot of materials from is a, a man by the name of Oscar Berlin. Um, I'm digressing, so we'll get back to the story. But Oscar Berlin wrote an article, a key article, and we'll talk about it when we get to the uh, sort of the uh, the big twist at the end of the story. And there is a, there is a bit of a twist. Um, Oscar Berlin wrote an article in the Sierra Club Bulletin in 1962, and he kind of brought this out. And Oscar had, was always wanted to write a book, and Oscar befriended Joe in the 60s, because Joe was the guy, Joe Doctor was the guy, and Oscar came, Oscar was like a labor historian, he was hardcore radical, he was going to tell this story, and I knew that they, they had known each other, and so Joe would tell me stories, ah, Oscar, he got too tied up in all that communist stuff, he couldn't write the story. <laughs> and uh, I got to know Oscar, and I, got them, I actually was able to, to get them back together uh, on the phone, and after 40 years or whatever, they talked to each other. And Oscar gave me all his materials. He gave me the drafts of the book he never wrote. You know, I, I had dinner with him a couple times up in, uh, he lived in El Cerrito, right near Berkeley. And when I did a presentation at the San Francisco Historical Society, the California Historical Society, um, Oscar came, Oscar and his, and his wife Paulette, and I joked, I said, gee, Oscar, I'm glad you and Paulette came, because you, you, you literally doubled my audience. So it was, <laughs> anyway. Um, so they start building the road up to the timber. Now meanwhile, think back, uh, they had filed these timber claims in the general land office here in Visalia in 85, late 85, I believe. And it looked, a little, it looked a little wonky. Someone said, hey, wait a minute, who are all these guys, all these like working men, and all these guys come traipsing in here, and they, they file all these, uh, you know, contingent, not, not contingent, uh, contiguous, contiguous. All these contiguous claims up in this timber area, like who who could even get there? And you know, then they thought, these guys are dummy entrymen. Is anybody familiar with that term dummy entrymen? No. Back in the day, like corporations would, would find guys on the street and say, hey, get your name, go file a claim, file for this thing, and they'd get these guys to file, you know, timber timber claims. They were timber and mining claims. So they get them. And then the corporation that sent them out, they'd sign them off to them, and that's how a big company could, could acquire land, sort of fraudulently. So land office thought, something wonky about this. So they start to investigate. They actually sent a guy up to Kauia back in, probably a couple of years into it, a fellow by the name of Andrew, Andrew Caldwell, and he filed a couple reports, and his initial reports were quite favorable. The government never acted on it. They just kind of beat around the bush, okay, you know. And so the claims were never patented. So but they pressed on. The colony was aware of the investigation. They, they tried to befriend this guy. They said, we're legit. And they basically were. It was, you know, all these guys that filed claims were all part of the crew. They were all working for their membership. They all had a stake. This, this um, community operated on a, a system of, rather than money, they, uh, on time checks. Um, 
you earn a time check. This is good for 20,000 minutes. So that was their, within the colony, that was their monetary system. So everybody's labor supposedly was equal. It was all about egalitarian sort of that. So they never did patent the claims, but they pressed on. And eventually, I don't need to show that picture because I showed you a real one. Right? So this paper served as a booming sheet. So one way they funded it was they had all these people that they, they sold subscriptions to, or you could work to get your subscription. What they really wanted was people that would buy subscriptions so they could you know, buy stuff in the real world. And they, they solicited subscriptions from all across the world. Um, there are people who came from England to join the colony. Got here a little late by the time it was, you know, and um, that's how they funded the, the hard money that they needed. Otherwise, within the colony, it was this system of time checks and all very egalitarian, all very cooperative, you know. Um, so finally, they get up to Colony Mill. And by 18. 1890, I think, uh, they start uh, cutting timber. And uh, they never really produced a huge amount, but they did actually start cutting timber. Meanwhile, the timber claims have not been patented. So they're just operating on, well, eventually they're going to, so we'll, we'll log it uh, regardless. And now uh, we're going to move along here quick. And um, meanwhile, Meanwhile, any of you familiar with a fellow by the name of George Stewart? Yeah. Not the George Stewart who wrote Ordeal by Hunger. Does anybody know who that George Stewart is? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not to be confused. The George Stewart we're talking about uh, ran a newspaper some of you might be familiar with, the Visalia Delta. <laughs> he ran, uh, George Stewart ran the Visalia Delta. Does anybody remember what the other paper was and who ran the other one? Ben Maddox wrote, ran the Tulare County Times. Right? It's only kind of time. But George Stewart, who we saw that picture earlier, he actually was working in the land office staff. But George Stewart started to kind of start a cause. He'd actually written about the colony in, in the Delta. And he wrote uh, initially rather favorably. Then he kind of turned on them. And there's a whole series that he wrote late in the game that was, was rather uh, critical of the colony. But he started agitating for a reservation of big tree growths. And he knew that a lot of the colony claims were in and around giant forests. Some of the claims actually were within the giant forest, but most of them were, like I said, a little lower down in the timber and pine, in the pine and conifer belt. But he started agitating. And he, he just discovered uh, that there was an area of big trees, one of the most spectacular groves. Anybody familiar with the Garfield Grove? Uh, again, named after I'm blanking on, it, on President Garfield's first name. Andrew? Andrew? Yeah. Um, he agitated for creating a national park, which was a very <coughs> new thing. In 1890, he started this campaign. Does anybody know um, what national park existed at that time? There's only one. No. Oh, no. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yellowstone was the first national park. 1870-something? Does anybody know offhand? Yeah, so it was a considerable amount of years before that. There were no other national parks. Anybody know what the second national park in America is? Huh? Sequoia. Sequoia? Yeah, we, we, got, we got Yosemite beat by seven days. <laughs> so, Stuart, Stuart agitated and, and worked for conserving this area where the Garfield Grove was. This is the South Fork Road. These, these two uh, townships, and this little, these little sections in, in this township, this was the original Sequoia National Park. So, um, trying to make a long story short, they're now logging up here at Colony Mill. They have built this road with you know, three or four years of hard labor. Where they get that hard labor? By promising me that'll work semen 
that you're going to be able, you're going to be taken care of in this cooperative colony, and everything will be in a little bit of a scam there. Uh, and he gets Congress to create a national park on September 25th, 1890, and it encompasses this land here. When that, when news of that broke, the colony said, "We're, we're safe." You know why? None of their claims, all their claims in here, here's giant forks. They had all this, these claims here in the, in the conifer belt where they were logging. No one's going to touch that. And they thought the government is eventually going to patent it. So a week later, something happened. Yosemite was created. Yosemite National Park, the third national park in the United States, was created October 1st, 1890. What does that have to do with this? When they created, and I've looked at the bill, I've looked at the, they, 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 uh, <coughs> Delta printed it, several newspapers printed the bill, creating Yosemite National Park. And like Section C, written in simply township range 13, township section this, never says where it is, they add five townships to the recently created Sequoia National Park. Right? Here's Sequoia, colony safe. <clears throat> a week later, a bill creates Yosemite, and hidden in that bill, I mean, it's written out, but who, who can read it? It's just a bunch of numbers. Adding five townships. Suddenly, all those claims, which are never patented anyway, are a national park. Nobody knew for like two or three weeks. The news did, it was, it was a while before the news hit. Um, so, that didn't bode well for the colony. Um, they ended up after that. So meanwhile, concurrently, and we'll talk about this at the end because I want to get into that, people always ask me what, what was the death knell of the colony? And you're probably thinking I just showed you the, the knife in the back, the dagger, the thing that ended the colony. But can anybody imagine what probably had as much, if not more, to do with the end of that Cooperative, I'll use that word again, cooperative endeavor. Internal strife. Personalities. There was um, there was arguments on how we're gonna, you know, there was a huge argument on how we're gonna vote for a board of trustees, all of this. It was political infighting. And a lot of it was exacerbated by Burnett Haskell's personality. I'll read a little bit uh, of the end of Burnett and Annie's uh, relationship, and you'll kind of get an idea of, of, what, of, of that. But yeah, it was, to a great degree, um, this infighting within the colony. So two concurrent things happened. They never patented the, the timber claims. Um, the park was mysteriously enlarged. I mean, even George Stewart didn't, wasn't really, I don't think he was aware of it. Why did they suddenly add all this land to the national park that they had just created? And, and then the eternal strife, and by 1891, the colony was pretty much in its death throes. By 92, it was completely uh, defunct. Um, things happened towards the end. They had actually had a member who bought uh, at least a land, and they were going to move their uh, they were going to move their settlement from advance down to what they called Kawea Town Site. And they moved it down there. And they actually, um, John Redstone, one of the leaders, started building the sort of the town site. And as the colony was sort of collapsing, this is an old, what we call old Kawea. And I have a connection to <coughs> that area. I wrote this book about the colony. I later wrote a book about Dr. Horace Grunigan, who ended up with his property. Dr. Dr. Grunigan was a son-in-law? Well, did a great nephew. No, great. He was related to John Redstone, the Redstone family. Um, John Redstone had, now we're getting some genealogy for you guys. So this is, John Redstone had two daughters, uh, the Redstone girls. Daisy, and I can't remember the other. And those two girls married the two Hobbit brothers. So the two brothers married two sisters. 
So the hopping and redstone, token, and this was the this was the this was the hopping stage. The hoppings actually operated the stage into the park in the early. So you know that name. And Dr. Grunigan's dad, uh, John Grunigan, married a hopping girl. So it was Ralph, and I can't remember the other hopping boy married Daisy, and I can't remember the other redstone girl. So when this property ended up, Dr. Grunigan bought the, ended up with this property. He inherited it as a hopping. His mother was a hopping. And he sold it to a, a, a fellow by the name of uh, Janine and Bob Chilcott in the 80s. And the Chilcotts raised Herschel and horses there, and they named it Redstone Ranch in honor of John Redstone. And the Chilcotts sell, sold it to uh, Chad and Jennifer Nicholson. They leased it. And re, you guys are familiar with Rialto Ranch? Rialto Ranch today, was, which for years and years and years was based in Exeter, uh, Tommy Mayer started it. I ended up writing about the history of, of uh, Riata and became very good friends with Chad and, and Jennifer. And I spent many a day, you know, sitting out there with Chad and Jennifer drinking beers, literally, uh, you know, to where this sits. And in front of there, the house, there's a pile of rocks, and we think those rocks are from the old days of Kuwaita. So, okay, we got we lost our narrative track. We got to get the, the narrative train back on the track. Where did we leave off? Um, colony, internal strife, and creating the park, right? So this was the latter days of the thing. So by the time they set up Kauia Town Site, this thing was, was, was uh, pretty much a failed endeavor. Uh, the Hopping stayed there for years. They became a, a park concessionaires. They ran the early days. The road went all the way up to Colony Mill, right? That's now National Park land. Eventually, in 1903, uh, Captain Charles Young finished that road into the park, into Giant Forest, and until the 20s when they built the General's Highway, that was the road into the park, it was the, co the colony built road, for the most part. The last few miles was built uh, by the, uh, the troopers who came in to administer the parks in the days before the National Park Service existed. So, one of my favorite pictures. These are the hopping, these are, these are some of the hopping kids. I honestly don't know what generation. I think these are John Redstone's grandchildren. Isn't that a lovely photo? Any guesses who might have been behind pushing that, that addendum to the Yosemite Bill that, that enlarged the park and basically stopped the colony from, from logging? And any get said the railroad. Any guess why they would have done that? That's the great. They wanted to control everything. Huh? They wanted to control everything. The railroad. Uh, one of the one of the early books I read was uh, Land in California. The W. W. Robinson. It was all about land history in California. What was the biggest landowner in California? First. Southern Pacific Railroad. The the railroad required huge amounts of land. In return for building a railroad, the government gave them alternating, alternating tracts of land. They owned huge amounts, you know, before Boswell bought it all up. They owned all kinds of land. So they had an interest in the value of that land. What's the one resource that makes land in California valuable? Water. Where do we get most of our water back in the day? Huh? Snowmelt. Yeah, we're, we're having some snowmelt right now, yeah? At night, and three rivers at night, it gets really loud because, like two in the morning, the river crests because it takes that many hours for it to melt. So if it's a hot day right now, it's crazy. They get the the the, the, the valley gets its water for the most part. Um, we were only a few years away from literally electricity being able to pump groundwater. They were starting to pump a little bit of groundwater by the 1890s, but for the most part, it was a canal system and diverting water, which was snowmelt. What might affect the rapidity of snowmelt in the Sierras? Logging. Southern Pacific had a vested interest in, in protecting the value of land in California, the lot of land that they owned. The theory was, and it's been borne out, if you log, seriously log the Sierras, you're going to hasten that snowmelt. If all the snow melts early, 
you got nothing later on. You want to slow that snow melt down because we're way more dependent on snow melt even then than we are now. What other interests might the, the, the Southern Pacific Railroad have financial interests? Shipping goods. Shipping goods. What was one thing they shipped from Northern California down to, to the booming lumber. Central California? Lumber. They didn't want the colony to lock. I mentioned Oscar Berlin earlier. I think he's the one that broke the story, I think. He discovered a, a map. There was a congressman by the name of William Vandiver. And William Vandiver at one point hosted a man, and you'll recognize this last name, and I think he's another branch of the family. I think we're not far from Zumwalt Park. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, I don't know which Zumwalt that's named after. I'm guessing it's the same, huh? Admiral Zumwalt. Yeah, there was a fellow named D.K. Zumwalt, which I don't know, they were related, I don't know if it was brothers or what. D.K. Zumwalt was, worked for can't remember what his position was, but there was I, he was, a, I think, a, at that point, uh, an attorney for the railroad. Not long before that addendum to the Yosemite Bill went through, guess who was a guest of Congressman Vandiver in Washington, D.C.? E.K. Zumwalt. Picture's bad, but... Not long, less than a week or two after uh, this bill went through, and before anybody really knew, the newspapers didn't know. You can't see this very well, and if I zoom it in, it's uh, you know it's not very good. Well, actually, you can see it pretty well. You see what that logo is? Another <coughs> Pacific. I don't know the dates on here, but it was long before anybody knew. Remember, we talked about the two original townships, mm -hmm. the three townships. These two townships, these little sections here, the original Sequoia National Park, George Stewart uh, worked so hard to create that, that, that protected the Garfield Grove. Look at these townships. What's right here? Now, if you're creating a national park, why would you do it just random, lower elevation pine and fir? I, you know, yeah, it makes sense. Over here was giant forest. Why would you do this? This goes all the way down to the foothill zone. Why would you do all this? To protect the railroad. Protect the railroad. So, who's responsible for one of the, the death blows to the colony? The Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, so, is that something about the colony you never knew? Yeah. When I was talking to Joe, doctor, the one thing he said. Here's my copy with my notes in it. Ah, here it is. We got 10 minutes, right? Um, I talked about um, the personality of Burnett and Annie. Um, Burnett, the later days, kind of became a little separated from everybody else. I've been. I've seen the I've seen the old foundation stones where they laid this log cabin. It's I'm on the North Fork. If any of you are familiar with where the Bailey Bridge is on North Fork, it's about a mile upstream from that on the opposite side that the road's on. And you can walk up there and, and you can I can there, there's also a stone. Well, this was a cabin, and I know where that is. And then over there's a some foundation stones from a little rock house they had. And uh, Burnett and Annie and the little baby. Uh, Roth, Astor Roth, they called Roth, lived there. This was separate from Korea Town site. It was separate from Advance. And you can see Burnett, he has you know, his documents here. He was a lawyer and all that. And they became a little um, set off from the rest of the group. By this time, a lot of the people in the colony just did not care for Burnett at all. And he eventually resigned, I think, in 91. And I mentioned. Uh, seeing Annie's diaries in the Bancroft earlier and getting that box and looking at them, not being able to read them, and finally was able to, to read them. And when I did, I realized that's the story. And even Joe Doctor, when he was telling me about this, he says, if you're going to write about the colony, just realize it's not about politics and, and all that. It's about the people. 
you know, Joe was, you know, what they called a, a country historian. And uh, he knew that, that the story of history is really the story about people. And he started going through Andy's diaries and, and some of Burnett's letters during that time. As the colony was falling apart, uh, they were falling apart. At one point, Burnett goes back to San Francisco to try and revive his legal business because they have nothing, you know. And I just want to read some of Annie's diaries and some of Burnett's letters, and I think these will you'll see the personality of, of this sort of remarkable couple. And this first one is um, as time is starting to get tough for her, and she writes in her diary. I was very disappointed at not hearing from Burnett today. It seems as if everyone has forgotten me. To think that we creatures who have evolved from moisture and warmth like bugs under a stone should develop the capacity to endure such maddening misery as we do. Roth and I took a beautiful walk this morning on the side hill. Ah, the lovely grasses and ferns and the wonderful little plants and mosses growing on barren, but for them, rock. I wish I could grow such beautiful things on the barren rocks in my life. So, she really could write, you know, and the marriage starts to disintegrate, and uh, in a chapter I call Resignation, Suicide, and Dispute, there was a suicide at, at the colony in the, in that, during those days, towards the end, but as things are starting to uh, collapse, and again from Annie's diary, from 1891, another year has dawned, how they do roll away, one after the other. And yet, it seems a long time since last New Year. Last New Year, I caroused. This one, I did not. I returned in time from the hall to welcome it in my own house, under my own roof, meaning the New Year. There is something in that. If Burnett had only been here. When I woke, I found a little bird fluttering about. How it got in, I don't know. But it surely came to bring us a message of good luck and happiness. A little bit of optimism there. And um, as Burnett stays away longer and longer, and, I mean, she's to the point where she's even struggling for food. And um, Burnett is becoming more and more despondent as well. And a lot of the time he's up in San Francisco while well, Burnett and, and Roth and Burnett's father are living at, at the homestead, which he, which he dubbed Arcady. Uh, at one point Burnett wrote, uh, I write, by 1892, the colony in shambles. Burnett Haskell was barely eking out an assistant, existent at his Korea homestead. In April 1892, he wrote in his journal, the model on my mantelpiece reads, I owe much, I have nothing, I give the rest to the poor. That about states my case. Oh, if only I ever get a chance to get on top again, I'll not play the fool. So he became very disillusioned. And uh, after he left and went to San Francisco, he started to get a little nasty with with Annie, and uh, he writes, this is June 23, 1892, my dearest wife, I am awful lonely here without you and Roth, and if I could see any way by which it might, I might be at Kawea with you, I would be there if I had to walk, but I don't. I am satisfied that if I stick to business and could only hold on for two months or so, I could make a go of it. This next line is very telling. I am neither drinking nor running around, but I'm hard at work all the time. You ought to write, goodbye, dear. So. When someone claims they're not drinking or running around, what does that usually mean? <laughs> well, it certainly means he's been doing it in the past. And it probably means he's still doing it up in San Francisco. Um, and he's trying to kind of make up with her over the long distance thing. And here you can really see um, she writes back, or she writes in her diary not long after this, Annie's diary, June 28, 1892. Had two letters from Burnett this evening. He was quite put out that he had not received letters from anyone here. Very strange, I should think. And then June 30th, two days later, he writes to her, Dearest Annie, your letter received, also that of wrath and free from death. I was beginning to feel seriously alarmed and was glad to find everything okay. Don't you think your epistle was rather icy? Yours in hope that your next letter will have imbibed some of the warmth you are probably having at Arcady. Uh -huh. And he writes a few days later, your decidedly unsatisfactory letter of one page posted on Monday reaching me this morning. I don't understand how you can have any complaint about my not writing. My letters have been long and frequent. Yours have not. I wrote you on June 20th, 23rd, 26th, 27th, July 1st, 3rd, 7th, 8th, 10th, 13th, 18th. A total of 22 
Five written pages, 500 words a page, a total of nearly 11,000 words. I think he's a little much. It is best to be exact in this world. Perhaps it is not a question of letters that has aroused the emotion you feel, nor the propinquity of a persona non grata. Have, perhaps, maybe the propinquity of a persona non grata have influenced you to search for something wherefore to take the absent to task. So, they are basically fighting it out uh, long distance. Uh, she writes on January 1st, 1897, a couple of years later. Um, we we could kind of see this coming, and uh, Burnett had mentioned that he wasn't drinking. He was uh, not only a drunk, but I think he was a drug addict to a certain degree. January 1st, 1897, five years later. I look forward to nothing but bitterness. As in the past year, so it will be in this. Drunkenness, poverty, abuse, neglect. My child and myself crowded in a little closer as possible to the wall. Unless there is hope for me, in me, myself, then there is nothing for me. January 2nd. I have been accused of trying to poison the old man, meaning Haskell's father. By this time, I think they were all living together in San Francisco. I think. I'm not 100% sure. <coughs> oh, when he was down at Kawea. So she's still at Kawea. Burnett was, ha was raving as usual this evening and said his father told him so. I did not believe his father told him any such thing, but called him up the stairs, and the old man said he did believe that I attempted to poison him shortly before I left Kawea. I told the old man that I never heard of anything so abominable. Two rotten men with hearts of wolves to attack one helpless woman. Shame, shame. I asked Burnett if he believed such a thing. I begged him to have the decency to say he did not. And he answered, I don't put it past you. <laughs> Burnett came over this evening in a raging fury. He had been drinking. He said he would get a divorce from me and marry Mrs. O and a lot more. Well, it was not a very pleasant thing. Burnett said he was glad I was going and hoped I would never come back. Oh, she left he, he died uh, alone on the beach in San Francisco, probably of uh, you know, drugs and alcohol and whatnot. Um, this is, this is in the, from the book. This is something that I wrote. There exists one interesting account of Haskell's final days, which comes to us via, the, via a letter scholar Rodney Ellsworth wrote to George Stewart in the 1920s. Ellsworth was doing historical research on Sequoia National Park in the Kuya Colony. Hmm, been there, done that. <laughs> he writes, One evening while I was telling a friend of my mother's about my work, I mentioned the Kuya Colony, and to my utter amazement found that the woman I was talking to was an old friend of the Haskells. It seems that Mrs. As Haskell accompanied her husband to Kuya and lived there some time, but on her return to Oakland remained as silent as a sphinx. She left her husband and supported herself teaching. Burnett Haskell, broken and apparently unable to find comfort nor rest from the nemesis that pursued, sought solace in strong drink. For several years, he lived in squalor in a mean hut of driftwood amid the lonely waste of the San Francisco sand dunes. He died in poverty and wretchedness with the sound of the sea moaning on the tortured sands. Such is the sad destiny of those who would cure the disorder of society by ignoble methods. end on that cheery note. <laughs> questions? We've got time for a couple questions, right? Anybody? Yes? Uh, what kind of drugs did they have in those days? Oh, a lot of the same ones we have now. Really? Yeah. Well, we, I don't think they had meth or crack, but, you know, opium-based. A lot of it was opium-based. Oh. A lot of it, you know. Okay. Uh, morphine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to think of drug addiction and drug abuse as, as a more contemporary thing, but it's really not. You know, laudlum. You know, did you say Emily Dickinson? You know what I mean? A lot of, you know, yeah. Oh. Currently, can you go up to Three Rivers and find remnants of the colony? If you know where to look. And yeah, I've been to, I've been, I've been to there, and there's nothing there. You got to cross private land, and you got to know how to get there. There's, uh, there are some, just, there are some ruins that are fenced at a place called An Advance. And for years, and I was guilty of it, I thought those were colony ruins. And you mentioned you saw the thing. We even put a little plaque there. These are the ruins of the colony. They weren't, they weren't colony ruins. There was a CCC camp there in the 30s. And those ruins there are from the CCC camp. I ended up writing the whole thing on the CCC for, for, the, for the newspaper years later. And um, 
Yeah. It's right where the colony was. But as a matter of fact, it's removed from the main part of advance. It's across the gully, and, and um, there was a, an archaeologist from Berkeley who did a her thesis on it. And she tracked me down, and we went up there with the photos, and she, we just determined exactly where that main part of that tent city was. Also, at the very end of the current end of North Fork, there used to be a campground, Yucca Creek, where Yucca Creek enters North Fork. There's a big flat out there. And there's a big area. And that was one of their um, like uh, smaller settlements as they were moved up the road. And there's a, another one further up the road. It was called Flagstaff. And I've tried to find that. I've walked the, the old colony the road a couple, three times. First time I walked it with Bill Tweed. Oh, I don't know if you know Bill. Bill. Yeah. yeah. Oh, were you on one of those? Yeah. Yeah, we might have been on the same one. It was a million years ago. About 20 years ago? <laughs> yeah, and I remember I was doing the research and I kept, you know, twisting. I had three people, three people who read uh, uh, versions of the manuscript that I was writing. I called my, my triumphant uh, uh, thing. And one was Bill Tweed. And another, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, one of the early books. This was published in the 50s, Yale University Press. It might still be in print today. Uh, Robert Hine wrote it, and it's California's Utopian Colonies. And there's a chapter on Kauia. And I had lunch with, with Bob Hine at UC Irvine. He was, he was a professor at UC Riverside for years and years and years. And, and then uh, after he retired, he moved to Irvine for some reason. And we had lunch, and I went to the university store and found this and bought it. And I was like, you know. I was all fanboy and everything, having lunch with Bob Hine. And he wrote to J. O'Connell, on whom the future of utopia now rests, with warmest regards and expectations, Robert Hine, March 12, 1998. So Bob, wrote, Bob read two versions of I would do the man, I would do a, a draft, send it to these guys for comments, you know, which is uh, everybody does when they interview a non fiction. Uh, and then the other one was Oscar Berlin. And Oscar read two drafts. And the last I heard from Oscar, I don't know if he's still alive. He was about my dad's age. So if he is still alive, he's 93 or 94. But probably 10 years ago, he emails me out of the blue. And at one point, he came down, and I gave him a tour of Warner Brothers. He was in town. And uh, it might have been a couple of years after that. And I gave him, you know, uh, we stayed in touch for three years. The last time he emailed me, he emailed and said, oh, I feel so bad. I, I was going through things and I found your book and I'm so sorry I never read it. So I read it and it's really wonderful. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, Oscar, you read it three times. <laughs> and so I think he was fighting dementia at the end. But it was, it, it was, it was kind of sweet because it's actually like read it for the first time and he had to email me and tell me how wonderful he thought it was. And I felt like saying, Oscar, who ripped it apart when I sent it for, you know, I mean, he was the most brutal of all my three readers. So, yeah. And then other books came out about it. Um, this one came out uh, was more of a picture book. And if you guys want to flip through it, there's the Korea Post Office. And I'll just leave that up here. If you want to flip through this. If anybody doesn't have and wants a copy of Train Rover's Daughter, I'm giving them for a special one day only price of free. So, you know, no bit, you know. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Uh, I think you mentioned Haskell. Uh-huh. Is the Haskell family here, is they possibly the center of that same Haskell? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, Haskell was interesting. He was, I brought this because I was going through, but oh, I'll leave this out. I forgot about this. This is the, the I, I think one of the very first things I ever had published. I think this was in 95. And it's a feature article on Kauia. That was the first thing I wrote about it. So this was like four or five years ago. So I'll leave this out here. You guys can look at it. Um, but ha but Burnett was he was obsessive compulsive. Okay, that's that we can we can you know. My brother-in-law was up was was going to Berkeley at the time, and I was looking for a manuscript that that uh, uh, someone's thesis was a, a biography of, of Haskell because Haskell is actually a significant figure in labor history. If you do any reading on labor history in California, Burnett comes up. I mean, he's not a major figure, but you know, he had some weird ties to Dennis Kearney, and, and if you guys know your labor history at all, that's a name that could ring a bell. And um, so he's a significant figure, even without the colony, 
Well, obviously the colony is a big part of the story. But my brother-in-law gets the finds the manuscript because it was something I couldn't access because I wasn't a student at, at Berkeley. And he gets it and he read it and he <laughs> sent it to me. And he goes, he goes, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but this guy's obsessive compulsive. <laughs> and he really was. He would he would go through periods of just being incredibly productive, and then he'd go into these deep depressions and he would just he would. He would make everybody around him angry and then hated him one minute, and then the next he would inspire these people to do these wonderful things. I mean, you know, so he really was a, a troubled genius. And I mean, you can see that. I mean, that letter where he tells Annie, this the days he wrote her, the number of the typewritten pages, the number of words, you know, that's obsessive. How did you spell Larson and Anthony Larson? Because we're Larsons. I don't know, it's been a long time since I spelled it. Uh, L-A-R-S-E-N, I would guess. Yeah, this is sweet as far as, as, as much as I know. And, and you know, here's the thing about history. Just because, oh no, L-A-R-S-E-N. Is that what I said? Yeah, L-A-R-S-E-N. Yeah, he keeps showing up in those pictures. Big guy, and you always recognize him with his mustache. Yeah, and so you guys can look through that. And then, oh, and then I got this. And is there, like, can I donate this to either the library or the, the Theological Society? This is a book that a descendant of Charles Keller wrote. And it's all the Keller family history. And there's a lot of colony stuff. There's also, um, uh, there were Kellers who were early uh, rangers up in Sequoia National Park. So it tells some early park history and all that. But it's this marvelous family history. And this woman put it together, and I told her, I said, well, look, I'll, I donated one to the Three Rivers Historical Society. Uh, I don't know if I ever got a copy over to the Annie Mitchell room, but I want to get it, I got a copy. And I told this woman, I said, look, you get it printed, and I'll pay you for the printing. So I think, I, you know, I spent 70, 80 bucks, and we had a bunch printed, and I'm just donating it. And so would it, would it go to, would you guys care to have it as a, I mean, as a resource for, uh, uh, yeah. So I've got two. If, if the library would like one, you know, or not, but if one's good, you know. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an interesting work of family history. We'll go in our surname and index. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, because there would be a lot of people who would want to do Keller family history. Um, and then the other branch of that, lower down, was uh, uh, Tobin. And Tobin was an early park. Uh, he was pretty high up in the park. And I can't remember, you know. I actually interviewed and got to know a little bit a fellow by the name of Leland Keller, Lee Keller. And Leland was Charles Keller's grandson. So, you know, Charles Keller, who, you know, the guy that overheard, hey, there's timber claims available, goes to his, you know, radical buddies and says, hey, let's go get us some timberland. That was, that was how the colony started. The, the timberland, did you have to homestead it like? No, it was, it was a little different than homesteading. Um, Haskell actually homesteaded Arcadia. And there were some homesteads, you know, in that lower part of the, of the North Fork Canyon there, there were already a number of homesteads that existed. And homesteading, there was a different, you know, you have to, you have to occupy improve. and improve. That Five was years. Yeah, there's, there's a, yeah. They get the D. Yeah. With the timber claims, it's not that. It's just you file the claim and, and they, they patent it and, you know, you not really own the land, you have to run. It's, it's similar to a mineral world, I believe. I don't know, I'm not a, 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 a land so Even the fact that they were working the land yeah. as soon as it became the national park. Well, they, they, they yeah. Bounced them out. Oh, they were arrested. They continued to cut after it became a national park, and they were arrested. Uh, other source of this story. Okay, so my final thing is, uh, it's, it's out of print. I don't really have any copies. The library has them. You can always check them out in the library. Right? I think you guys have two copies. Uh, my cellular library has some. There's probably some in the Annie Mitchell room. If you really want to get into it, I donated uh, Xeroxes of all my research to the Annie Mitchell room. So they have, you know, they have copies of Annie's diary and all this. It's all, you know, second, third generation photocopy. But uh, I've always, in my production offices, I would get the free Xerox. So I'd go in and I'd all kinds of stuff. Um, but you can access it digitally online. There's a site called Your Sequoia, Y O R E, like, you know, like Tales of Your. It's called Your Sequoia, 
uh, this woman, she's an archaeologist, her name is Lily. I can't think of her last name. She put this together because I had, uh, I had digitally had it on Three Rivers News, and Three Rivers News went, went, uh, went down. Um, and so it's available there, or you can go on Amazon, and if, if you guys are into reading books on Kindle, um, I've, I've made the turn and I read now. 90% of my books I read on Kindle. And if you're, if you're a resident, if you're medicine about doing that, if you're like, oh, I want to write my books in old-fashioned paper, the great thing about my Kindle book is it's easy on the eye. I don't have to find a, a nice, well-lit place to read because it, it illuminates and it's not like a, it's not a harsh light. And after I'm reading for a while, my eyes get tired, I make the font a little bigger. <laughs> and I just love it. But you can get you can get co-op co dreams on Amazon. You can also get all my other books, all Kindle versions. And you can get it on Your Sequoia. Your Sequoia, you can just go on your computer, click it, and every chapter is there. Um, I was so glad that Lydie did that because I just want it available if people want to, you know, get into it and, and, and read it. So I want to make sure I don't take the library copies. The library. All right, I think that concludes uh, today's presentation.